Love staying informed? Subscribe now and get unlimited access to local news, weather, and sports for just 99 cents a month for your first three months at inform.news join. Read every story, listen to every podcast, and download the apps that keep you informed and on the go 24 hours a day. So head to inform.news slash join right now to subscribe. What are you waiting for? Get three months of local news for just 99 cents a month at inform.news slash join. Welcome to Plain Talk, and we're going to be talking about uh, the gubernatorial race and not the Republican primary. We're going to be talking to Merrill Pepcorn, who's the Democratic candidate uh, for governor, uh, just announced. And he was, uh, there was another gentleman, Travis Hipsher, who was, he had announced he was running. He's since gotten out of the race, if you haven't seen that news. So at this point, Merrill, with the uh, Democratic uh, state convention looming this weekend, uh, Meryl Pepcorn is the only Democratic candidate, so I'm, I'm assuming uh, his endorsement at that convention is is going to be pretty uh, confirmed. Of course, joining uh, Meryl joining us, uh, Chad Oban, my my co-host. And Meryl, I wanted to start out with the first question. I'm reading my colleague April Baumgarten's headline over her article about your campaign announcement this week, and it says Fargo Democrat Meryl Pepcorn says he can bring North Dakotans together as he runs for governor. And so my first question is, how in the hell are you going to manage that? <laughs> because I, Republicans aren't even together a, at this point. If we look at a lot of the drama leading up to the NDGOP convention, I'm I'm curious. How do you d- unite? And, and this isn't a North Dakota problem either. I mean, America is divided right now. How do you play a uniter in this environment? You know, why don't you start off with the tough questions, Rob, uh, oh, rather than pussyfooting around with it. <laughs> <what he's saying. laughs> well, uh you know, maybe maybe making the effort to bring North Dakotans together. And you know how you how you really do that is that you know there are several Republican senators. I've been in the Senate since uh, 2017 was my was my first session. And over the course of time, well, I'm, term limits is another thing. But uh, you know, you get to know people over over several years and over a few sessions, and you get to know people when you're walking down the hallway and talking with them. You get to know people when you're members of the of the Bolo Thai caucus that is, re, you know, comprised of Merrill Pepcorn and, and five Republican senators. And we have fun with that. And just getting to know people. And you, you, you get to know people uh, in the committees. When you're sitting next to a person in committee and you're able to talk a little bit in between in between bills and during little breaks and such. And uh, it, when you can get in the same room and just talk as people and not put politics aside because that's why you're there, but just you get to understand other people's points of view. Even if you don't agree with them, you don't have to get mad about them and you can talk about them. And most of these things, most of these issues uh, you can find some cr- common ground to work in, uh, work in, and work with. The problem has been the supermajority of the Republicans, not just in the legislature, but also holding that governor's office for so many years. There hasn't had to be anything like that, and so I think getting a, a voice in there, uh, representing the views of many, many North Dakotans, is needed to have these discussions that you're talking about. The people who don't agree with the the uh, the agenda of or the point of view of the supermajority, they would like a voice as well. And currently, I, I, to me, it seems like they're locked out. And I can provide at least that voice in these discussions, and we'll get together and talk about them. How about it? Was that a lengthy enough answer for you, Rob? I was just fine. Yeah, th- this is this is audio, so you can you can put a little bit of meat on the bone answering questions here. You don't have to be too yeah. Uh, quick. Yeah, we so, don't we don't we don't, have a, we don't have a commercial break bearing down on us. <laughs> yeah. Well, that's all right too. Yeah. yeah. So thanks for joining us, Meryl. I, you know, I think the idea of of bringing folks together is sort of refreshing, uh, considering what we're seeing on TV. I mean, it seems pretty clear to me that. Kelly and Tammy are trying to nationalize this race in some way. I've joked to people that I didn't know Biden and Trump were running for governor in North Dakota. 
so tell me about, I mean, and it was pretty clear that presidential politics is not not why you're getting into this governor's race. How, how do you how do you get an electorate to focus on local issues when so much stuff is nationalized? And and if you could talk a little bit about what are those issues that you want to focus on if you're elected governor that maybe aren't the hot button issues that we talk about so often on this show. Well, you know, I starting with your first observation about people's opinions being formed by national news. And you know what, from my point of view, North Dakotans and North Dakota Democrat nonpartisan leaguers, most people don't know about what NPL nonpartisan league stands for. They don't know what it is. To me, it is important. I always include it, at least in my opening uh, statements and opening of the conversations that we are the North Dakota Democratic Nonpartisan League. It's that part of the party that drew me to the party in the first place. But uh, getting back to the question, I think a lot of that, a lot of our North Dakota Dem NPL party, we get painted with that same broad brush that the media paints the National Democratic Party with, the people in Washington, D.C. And I don't even know what, uh, I don't even know what, uh, AOC stands for. Uh, I, I don't know what the, the the person's name really, but it doesn't make any difference. They go, AOC does this, AOC does that. Uh, you get a few of the headline making things that several people are looking for those for those hot button issues, and then that's what goes out over Fox News. A lot of people watch Fox News. I don't even know why they call call it the news. And there are the same news programs, news in air quotes, on the left. And people can select what news they watch. So I think that really, really hurts the North Dakota Democratic Nonpartisan League. We, uh, we are ourselves, and we have our business to conduct here in the state, and uh, at least public perception-wise. You know, uh, they talk about Democrats being, you know, uh, high taxes and big spenders. You know, simple as that. Uh, and now it's all the social issues that 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 take the take the front. So, you know, it, it's tough being, I, I, we, there's an uphill battle facing that national media painting North Dakota Dem NPLers with that same broad brush as the liberal Washington, D.C. politicians, because we are not all like that. And I would say we're quite independently not like that. So let's, let's focus on policy then. Let's, what's your okay. policy agenda? If, if we, get, we get past the November election, you're elected to a four-year term as governor. What does the Pepcorn administration focus on? Well, let's talk about, I'm a firm believer in, uh, to put it simply, and it can be nuanced. There's several ways to go about this, and, and uh, people have questions about it. What does that mean? But simply said, public money for public education. That is the background of education in America and in North Dakota. My mom was a country school teacher for much of her teaching career. I was her student in a country school in first and second grade, had a great public education here in Fargo. Uh, third grade I spent in Stanley, then the family moved to Fargo. I couldn't have asked for a better public education. Uh, my son was raised all the way from kindergarten through graduating high school in the Fargo public school system. So, so and, what, is, uh, what does that mean as a matter of policy, though? Because, like, when I usually yeah. when, when we, get, uh, yeah. we get we get some of these rankings, and it's like per yeah. capita spending on K twelve or per student spending on K twelve. Yeah. yeah, North yeah. Dakota usually does pretty well. Um, I'm not going to say we're at the top of the list, but I mean we punch above our weight. I think sometimes I, I feel like we do pretty well. So, what does it mean public money for public education? Because I think a lot of people hearing that saying, "Well, we're already funding." public schools and given how upset people are about their property taxes and um, the amount of property taxes are made up by K-12 funding. Um, I mean, I, I guess quantify that beyond the, I, I guess the headline. It is our duty, as I understand it, uh, according to North Dakota law and the century code to provide funding for full funding for, for public education, for public instruction. And so I think then what it means, you also mentioned property tax. And of course, a lot of the property tax is directly related to school taxes. Does that mean that perhaps we even more fully fund public education from the state of North Dakota? 
to take the pressure off the property taxes? Yes, that's what I say. Does that mean somehow, and I don't know the intricacies, what it would take to unlock the key to some of those legacy fund monies. People know we have $10 billion and there's probably 10 billion ways people wanna spend that money. But I think it's our duty to look into that and even more fully fund the education that we're talking about. Does that uh, answer your question, Rob? Yeah, I think so. Partially, it's our responsibility. And uh, and as far as the private schools go, and I know you know there's a lot of pressure. There's been pressure. Uh, well, right now, this last legislative session, uh, the legislature passed it uh, for a five thousand dollar up to a five thousand dollar contribution to a private school. You'll get that credited on your on your income tax. You'll get a tax credit for that. Well, I voted against that. Um, again, that's siphoning money. That's chipping away. Uh, money towards the pub, uh, private schools. And I mean, I've got private school friends and and, and classmates. And and uh, now that that was a long time ago. I was in in high school, but that's just kind of the way uh, the way I was raised. And I think that uh, that they they offer certain uh, advantages and opportunities for for uh, some students. And I, they have managed to find ways to scholarship students that want to get to those private schools. So I think that's it's kind of up to them, and uh, we have to we have to uh, fulfill our commitment to our K through twelve schools. Hey, Merrill, you served on the Senate yeah. um, Finance and Tax Committee. Yeah. Obviously, there's lots of discussion about how to handle taxes right now. Yeah. Initiated measure to eliminate property ta yeah. taxes. Yikes. Obviously, the Miller campaign, and I think Kelly's agreed as well, the idea of getting rid of income taxes. Can yeah. you talk some about like how you'd approach it? How do you feel about the initiated measure to eliminate property taxes? Would you uh, advocate for eliminating income taxes? How would you handle those issues? Because you're right, North Dakotans look at the state and they see budget surpluses, they see $10, million, $10 billion in the legacy fund, and their property taxes are still going up. How would you handle sort of the tax issues while, while being able to fund the, the priorities we have? Well, first of all, you need taxes to pay for the basics. That's, you know, what's the role of government? Well, one of my friends uh, says, well, the base, you know, the two backbones of uh, govern, government needs to do is pay for, you know, education and roads. Well, so we need taxes. As far as the property tax uh, elimination goes, no, we can't do that and leave the local uh, political subdivisions, the cities, the townships, the school districts, we cannot leave them uh, all of a sudden just stranded. As I haven't seen uh, a plan to replace those funds. So no, we can't eliminate that. And again, can the state provide some some relief to take that to take that burden off the local the local uh, taxing districts? Yes, if that's what it takes, then let's do that. I am not for eliminating, making further uh, income tax cuts. Uh, we did some in the legislature last session, and really that mostly affected people like me, I would say middle class uh, earners, uh, none of my neighbors. I mean, I live in a neighborhood, North Fargo, people own their houses, uh, keep up their property, keep up their houses, and have invested in our neighborhoods. And uh, are, they're growing kids here as well as green grass on their lawns and uh, and, and don't complain. I didn't hear one complaint. I did, you know, door to door campaigning is the most effective. And I did not hear one complaint about income tax. And I think that so the tax breaks we got this last session, well, you know, and people are going to take them, but uh, we cannot just uh eliminate the the income tax for the higher earners i'm just uh, opposed to that so i the the former or, huh, former governor i guess he's been gone president you know campaigning for president he's not the former governor our current governor uh was really i mean he was pushing that from from la the summer before the session began and uh just support for that way yeah. it was a big big goal of his and it is not going to benefit your average north dakotan and will uh, just benefit the rich in, a, in an well, unbalanced fashion. I, I can tell you, having looked at my own taxes, I am an average North Dakotan and am not rich. I work in the newspaper industry, for crying out loud. And, yeah, well, uh, I'm a broadcasting and, 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 background. And eliminating the income tax would certainly benefit me. Um, 
paying for school lunches would benefit me more. But, um, yeah. you know, I, I mean, I, I don't I, I think to say that it's not going to benefit anybody, I think, is is, oh. is not true. Um, a little over the job. Okay. But let me but well, let me I, let me let me ask you this, because I'm, I'm listening and, and, you know, you're talking about spending more on K through 12, um, you know, basically opposing tax cuts and everything. You know, I, I, I started my first question was, how are you going to unite North Dakotans? And I guess maybe a derivative yeah. of that question is, how are you going to win an election in a state like North Dakota in order to win an election in a state like North Dakota? You're going to have to persuade a lot of voters who have been cast in their ballots for Republicans in the past. What do you yeah, what do you off what are you offering those voters to say, you know, come away from Republicans and come vote for a Democrat? I mean, because I'm I'm not sure that more spending and opposing tax cuts is going to do it. Again, why don't you get to the tough questions, Rob? Quit <laughs> pussyfooting around with these <laughs> with these field good I'm questions. I'm sorry, right? I'm curious. <laughs> well, there we get to this common ground thing. Let's 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 uh, kind of narrow that down. Yeah, I mean that's uh, what I'm interested in. Where's just, where's the common just, ground between you and and the however many nor, you know Republican voters you need to peel away to win? What is that common ground? Yeah, that's a that's a that's a tough question. I haven't had my I haven't had my pollsters research the. Uh, the questions that uh, are going to resonate with those kind of middle of the road Republicans. But, you know, I, uh, I consider myself a moderate uh, Democrat NPLer here in North Dakota. And what I need to do, and there we, there we come again to common ground. There was a lot of, a uh, lot of discussion last session about funding private schools. And I would think there's going to be, Again, more discussion about that. I have a feeling that there might be a need to to take a stance where no, we're not ever going to do anything to to uh, to help fund private schools. But you mentioned something. This is be a popular. This has been a popular idea for legacy fund monies. If we have to tap into it for that, school lunches, maybe not just for the public school kids, but for all school children in North Dakota. We'll feed you uh there's well, I, you know, think, maybe, I think most of maybe chad can answer i think most of the private schools use the school lunch program anyway is, is right. that am i right. am i wrong right last session uh private school students would have been eligible just like public schools so i think what merrill's saying is absolutely right this would affect public and private sure. schools okay yeah so you know that that's just one issue uh and when it comes to uh well i don't know uh yeah, you know that's what to tell you the truth. Rather than just make stuff up, Rob, I guess is that I have work to do. I have to go and listen to. I'm going to conduct a a campaign that I call a statewide version of door to door campaigning. My friend in the news, uh, because I worked with him for many years at Prairie Public, Dave Thompson, refers to North Dakota as a small town with really long streets, and we have to go around knock on doors meet people where they are. We plan on having town rallies and meetings across uh, many, of the, many of the towns in North Dakota, find out what is important to them and really find out where I stand, not what I can do for you. Here's what I'm gonna do for you, but find out, we have a long, we got a lot of work to do to find out what they're looking for, what they need, and then, and then uh, see, if we can, see if we can accomplish uh, that or if we agree with them. I know that, the one thing we're always concerned about is infrastructure, roads, simple things like roads, uh, the equipment that, that the oil business and today's agriculture businesses. We used to have those little dump trucks, you know, the little little tandem trucks. I think they're called with the dump on the back of it. And you go get a load of grain, take it into the elevator, into your granary. Now they're tandem uh, trailers on big semis. Our roads aren't built for that. We it's our responsibility. I know the townships are struggling all the time to uh, find funding for roads. The roads are, I've heard from one person out there who works in that area with their township, roads are flattening out. They're, they're getting wider. They're flattening and just kind of spreading out and they're getting lower and harder to maintain. So I don't know, that's kind of, I, I don't think I really answered your question there, Rob, but uh, maybe you can steer me back to uh, what you're looking for again. <laughs> well, I'm, not, I'm not trying <laughs> to scare you. No, no, no. Merrill, you obviously have been in the Senate for four sessions, getting elected in 2016. Thinking back to your time in the Senate, 
what would you say your your biggest accomplishments are? Because I think that's often a pretty good indicator of what type of governor you'd be thinking about the issues you worked on in the session and what you've been able to accomplish. Understanding perfectly well being in the super minority, those accomplishments um, might not have been uh, getting bill signs necessarily. But what did you work on in the Senate yeah. that you think you can bring to the governor's office? Well, you know, uh, that's an interesting question too, because one of my pet peeves is when politicians go out either they're campaigning or maybe they're giving a, a speech to a group is the oh i introduced this bill and uh i uh i supported this bill and we passed this and and uh maybe it's because i haven't had a lot of success my first bill i introduced when i was elected in 2016 first session begins right away in 2017 the first bill I introduced was to restore the oil extraction tax to six, uh, six and a half percent from from the five percent. The legislature lowered it to it. I, I think, Rob, we had a conversation about that at the time. You I called think we me did. Up and, and you called me out on that. <laughs> yeah. And, and perhaps rightfully so. But yeah. Uh, so there there was that. that one didn't fly too far. OK, that got defeated on pretty, pretty uh, straight lines. Uh, but, you know, I. I actually did sponsor, but I think I think one of the Republican senators kind of handed it to me because they were busy doing some other work. But uh, uh, making it easier for organizations like Habitat for Humanity. And again, Chad, I think this kind of goes back to where my feelings lie about our responsibilities as government towards towards our citizenry. Uh, we're talking about affordable housing to make it easier for Habitat for Humanity. And there are a couple of other groups as well operating in North Dakota to go about their business by not having to pay the the small amount of a contractor's license fee. Uh, that's that's waived. But any little thing like that will be beneficial to you know to the to the people of North Dakota. So that was a nice small thing, a bipartisan thing. There was a law that was pr uh, brought to me by uh, Chief Zabalski of the Fargo PD, a real common sense. I won't go into the details about it, but the purpose of it was to cut down on high speed chases through town by using modern technology and cameras and so on and giving time and tracking down the owner of the vehicle. And it uh, flew through our committee and it, uh, I think it was the, uh, oh, I forget what committee it was heard in front of IBL maybe. Uh, and then it uh, passed in the Senate with a considerable majority and then was came out of committee in the house with the do not pass and then was defeated in the house i think maybe for just political reasons because it was a kind of a common sense uh, not a harmful bill and uh so politics kind of got in the way but we had a lot of you know that's the way the legislature worked it uh, had a lot of bipartisan support in the senate and not as much in the house and the bill was defeated there was one small, another small bill, a small accomplishment was uh, a bill to protect uh, a certain amount of money from the, for the beneficiaries of uh, certain, certain uh, life insurance. Uh, so that, for example, if a, if a person had a, a certain amount of life insurance in a policy, and they died to bankrupt and creditors came after that life insurance policy, this would set aside at least a certain amount of that money for the beneficiaries. And that received the bipartisan support and passed. And uh, it wasn't uh, an exceptionally large amount of money protected, but it was originally, in, the money is in, originally intended for those beneficiaries. And uh, so that was, that was an accomplishment and it didn't receive too much resistance. And that was a, a bipartisan bill as well. And then, uh, and just jumping in, you know, there was a lot, there was a lot of uh, controversy in the legislature uh, in Game and Fish when it came to this uh, uh, baiting of uh, deer baiting and uh, trying to control the chronic wasting disease. And I have a lot of respect for the Game and Fish Department, and I have supported them in uh, nearly every one of their efforts. They just do a great job managing the uh, the wildlife here in North Dakota. In fact, you know, yesterday we had a press conference. Um, I I would say Tuesday, Tuesday morning we had a press conference. Uh, what was that? Tuesday, April second, uh, nine o'clock press conference in Fargo. That afternoon, two o'clock in Bismarck. So we drove out there on uh, I ninety four 
at a reasonable speed, yet still <laughs> making it on time. Uh, and the flocks, the flocks of snow geese, and uh, maybe some hawkers mixed in there as well. Just incredible. You know, that drive across North Dakota, a lot of people complain about it. I think it's beautiful. It's different every time. I like it. But, you know, we got a game and fish department that's, it. you know, they're in charge of, of managing that wildlife. So I was standing with game and fish, and I got some calls from people that were very intimidating towards me. And I know our, our game and fish biologist who was, you know, I got to stick with the science on this. They're doing the best to preserve our game and protect. Uh, our, I, I wrote public. about that debate and it got, yeah. I mean, it got ugly. Yeah. Uh, unfortunately. And I'm telling I, you, when, when people are calling me and just not threatening me physically, but you know, you know, I'll, you know, I'll tell you what, you know, this is, and, and using intimidating, I will call it rather than threatening language. That's not going to fly. So I, I stood yeah. by my guns and by my guys there, game and fish. And just, a, you know, a couple of things. I think we have really, really good people working for the state at any of the departments that I've gone to for my business, Secretary of State's office, business registration, uh, the tax office when I've needed help. Uh, filling out a form for state or, or, or my business or personal income tax. Uh, really, really good people. The, the finance director of financial institutions, the securities uh, commissioner, I mean, and all the people in the work in those offices, boy, it's a good, good quality of people we have working for the state. I, so it's kind of a second there. What, what we were just saying about that, about that baiting bill. And that was, I mean, I yeah. think at, at one point, and I don't, I don't want to say, but at one point that bill had more submitted testimony on it, I think, than any other bill this session. You think about some of those bills. I mean, there were some, like some of yeah. the, the, the transgender focus bills or whatnot. I mean, yeah. those were really kind of headline making, drew yeah. a lot of posh, passionate response from both sides. The baiting bill by my count, I'm pretty, I, I get, I guess, I mean, I, I don't know of another bill that had more submitted testimony, but my, my question was, we, we kind of live in an era where, you know, those issues, politics has become so performative, um, where I, I think voters, unfortunately, and I shouldn't say all voters, but a lot of voters, unfortunately, have, have come to value sort of, sort of performance from their candidates. So when you're sitting here talking about, um, you know, uh, you know, I want to focus on roads. And I, I think all that stuff's great, you know, whether yeah. I agree with you or not. I mean, those are the issues we should be talking about. How do you break through to voters, though, that just want you to throw bombs, that just want you to say nasty things or cutting things about Kelly Armstrong or Tammy Miller, wh whoever your opponent ends up being? Um, how do you break through to those voters and say, no, we really do need to focus on organizing our state well and making sure our roads can are, are up to, to meeting our needs for, for commerce and travel and uh, our public education system is is, is ready to serve our, our education needs. How do you break through the, the, to those voters in this environment? Well, I know one thing I won't do is uh, start going negative on my opponent, whoever it might be, uh, come, come for that November election. We'll know after June, I suppose, unless one of the two front runners for that Republican nomination decided to come around and run as an independent for governor. That would be my ideal scenario, of course. <laughs> Split that Republican vote into two. That would yeah. open that door just a little bit larger. Although, although I think they're both right. committed to going to the June primary, and if they lose in yeah. June, I don't think they can. We have a sore oh, loser law, so they can't. No, they that's can't. too bad. Yeah. Maybe as governor, I would change that law right now. <laughs> so, that, <laughs> so they can both get on the ballot. No, uh, please don't. Please yeah, don't do yeah, that. But I, don't, I, I know what you mean. You know, uh, uh, again, you know, there are, if you're strong on an ideology, uh, I, I don't think there's anything you can probably say, uh, sit down and, and, uh, talk, talk to people and say, no, that just is not right and convince them, uh, otherwise. But I believe that most North Dakotans are concerned about, you know, what we do here in North Dakota and are not concerned about the social issues that have come up, that the hot button issues that get all the headlines that suck all the air to the room, as they say. And, uh, and again, uh, I think that most of the people realize that and why people aren't the, the politicians aren't talking about those things. Maybe that's why they're, they're not so interested in it because they're not hot button issues. I could show you uh, when my first, 
and second elections for the state Senate, the the flyers that were coming into people's mailboxes about me. Uh, <laughs> you know, my neighbor lady uh, eventually was going to the mailbox before her kids could, so they wouldn't have to take out these, you know, these cards with the pictures on them and then they're photoshopped and there's pictures of me and then my running mate at the, not running mate, but in the house, uh, Carla Rose showing us in front of a, a burning city saying that we support rioters and we're against law enforcement. And, and you know what, the, the more, the more outrageous things that they, that they sling our way, the more it hurts them and the more support we get. So I think staying the course, just talking about the issues that affect North Dakotans and leaving some of that other stuff aside. It's too bad we aren't on video because I'm using such great hand gestures here. <laughs> and leaving that other stuff aside, uh, I think it'll benefit me in the long run. So Rob, I, I, I quibble with you a little bit on that uh, in that the we, will, we will break through to those yeah. people and by meeting them and talking to them. I, I will accept your quibbles and accept, uh, <laughs> uh, although I, I will defend myself by yeah. Oh, yeah. every time I open up social media, I feel like my cynicism is, is justified, but it's validated every single time. Validated, but uh, you're, uh, you're right. Yeah. There's still room for optimism and I'm, I'm glad to hear it, Merrill. Uh, thank you so much for coming on and taking the time today. Thanks, Merrill. Well, you know, uh, let's do it again a little bit later on because, you know, right now I will admit I, I'm selling myself as a person. Sure. People know me from coast to coast here in North Dakota, from Fortuna to Fairmont and and from up there in, in Pisic and Nechi down to uh, down to Amadon because of the work I've done in radio as an entertainer uh, and uh, as a door-to-door -door salesman uh, uh, several years ago. So so people know who I am. And, you know, they're, they're kind of judging that uh, their belief in me in knowing me and who I am. And I've got work to do. I'll tell you, I've got work to do when it comes to firming up uh, planks of a platform and identifying those three. Everybody said, well, pick three things and really pound. Well, I'm not sure what those three things are yet. We talked about education. We talked about infrastructure. There's uh, housing and, the, and health care for North Dakotans, a lot of things. And, and I do need work on that. And here's what we're going to do. We're going to talk to people and find out and, and then, and, uh, they're going to help me form uh, my, I've got a general philosophy. They know where I'm coming from and I do need to get more specific and we will, you know, as this campaign progresses. Merrill, thanks for your time. Champagne yeah. dreams and caviar. What's that Robin Leach statement? <laughs> I promise you. <laughs> I don't remember. Champagne, do champagne caviar dreams, something. caviar, or maybe it's caviar dreams, know, champagne nights and caviar dreams or something. I don't know. Yeah, there we are. I don't care. I can't yeah. remember. All right. I don't care either, Rob. <laughs> yeah. Well, thank you. know, and I do want to, I, I, I've said this to you before. I give you credit for, you know, carving out a living, being an opinion columnist in North Dakota. Uh, and, uh, as an independent businessman, I don't, you might even be employed now by the forum, but you know, uh, people who can do that, you've got to have yeah. a lot of independent spirit. And, and, uh, so regardless of opinions over the years, you know, there, I appreciate people who can uh, go ahead and carve out something like you're doing too. So I look forward to visiting with you, you know, regularly over the course of the next seven months. Okay. Yeah, definitely. We'll, we'll definitely have you on again. Thank you so much, Marilyn. Thank you for the Thanks kind words. The cold cases you see at The Vault have captivated readers across our region for years. At The Vault Podcast, our team of professional reporters takes you further into those stories with new interviews from family members, investigators, and experts. Check out The Vault at inforum.com slash The Vault and subscribe to The Vault wherever you find your podcasts. All right, just finished up our interview with Merrill Pepcorn, who is a uh, Democratic state lawmaker, Democratic MPL state lawmaker, very important to get the MPL part in, uh, who is going to be running for, for governor. Um, and I, I, listen, I like it when people come on and they're just candid with us. Like I ask him, like, how are you going to peel off Republican voters? Well, he doesn't know yet. Um, he's going to go find yeah. out. I, I mean, I I appreciate that. I mean, there's there's honesty in that rather than just giving me some argle bargle that sounds nice i like that you just told me how it was i uh i find that refreshing i guess yeah i mean merrill's not the most polished politician you're ever going to see and 
uh, obviously doesn't, I mean, he said at the end, he's still working through what that platform will look like. And, you know, is there, he sort of, you know, hokey sort of has his, you know, Prairie Public music sort folksy. of thing. I think folksy. Let's be folksy. a little, like, wow, that was very mean. You called him hokey? Well, I, I don't mean it. As, I'm like, supposed really to be mean. I'm supposed way. to be mean to the Democrats, Chad. Well, no, I don't, like, I don't mean it in a derogatory way. Maybe <laughs> folksy's better, but I don't think of it as, folksy's as being better. that bad. No. Um, he might even but, agree that he's a little hokey. Maybe yeah, I mean, I think the question becomes, you know, and one of the things that Merrill should be thinking about is Tammy and Kelly are going to run very, very sophisticated, polished campaigns. I don't think Merrill should try to be over polished. He shouldn't he's try not to win. do something he's, he's not. not. He's not going to win with that sort of strategy because he can't compete with them. They're right. going to have wh so whoever... I think he should yeah, whoever emerges as a nominee is going to have just they're going to have more money and a more sophisticated operation. But I think I mean, we have evidence that you don't have to beat the person in fundraising. You just have to beat them in votes. And is there a place for somebody who is authentic to your over uh, earlier point and honest? Um, is there a place for that in this race? And I think that's a contrast. right? I think I think Kelly, quite frankly, is very transparent and very honest but I'm not sure it comes through in TV commercials, um, right? And so, I, you know, I, I think it's it's interesting. I'm glad Merrill's running. I wish we would add more time. I would have liked to ask him what his thought process was, giving up a pretty safe state Senate seat um, to, to make this race. Yeah, because um, he, would, he would normally be up this cycle, right? Yeah, Josh Broche is moving up to his Senate seat. Yeah, that's right. Oh, that's right. Yeah. That was just I, just, I just saw that headline. Yeah, so I think it's, I mean, it'll be interesting. I mean, again, I don't know that he's as polished as he's going to need to be on policy, but um, he'll get there. I really think, and this is why I asked him the questions. I mean, I, I think the fundamental Rubik's Cube or puzzle that they have to unlock is, and, and, and I think they have a good opportunity because there's a lot of, there's a lot of, I think there are Republican voters in North Dakota who are feeling disillusioned. And are open now. I don't know if they're if they're disillusioned about a Kelly Armstrong or even a right. Tammy Miller, but I think there is an opportunity to say Republicans have been getting a little carried away. Um, they've been indulging some of their. I I, I don't know. I, I don't want to. They've been indulging themselves. I think that's the right word for it because they're not afraid of Democrats losing. I think there are Republican people who have been voting for Republicans who are persuadable. And I think landing on what that right message is. And I think for someone like Merrill Pepcorn, I think you have to leave some progressive hobby horses behind and really yeah. focus on those issues that are going to unite a, a bipartisan coalition to elect you. Right. I, I think the equation is very difficult statewide for Democrats. I mean, you look at any election. It's like, hey, good job, Oban. Way to come up with that. But I mean, essentially what you need to do if you're a Democrat is get all the Democrats all the independents and peel off like 20% of the Republicans. That's a difficult equation uh, to work yourself through. And the problem that like Merrill has, you said, you know, leave some of those hobby horses behind. I would have liked to hear him talk more about tax cuts and some of those sort of uh, maybe things that would be more appealing, but how do you well, he did, he did talk about them? He says he says against them. <laughs> yeah. But, but how do you ask me to be authentic, but then also, I mean, I mean, that, that is who he is. I mean, yeah. I don't know. I mean, it, it may be just that you have to open your mind to some new ideas. Uh, right. or maybe there's a way to get, I mean, I mean, it, I should say, I don't want to characterize him as being across the board against tax relief. He was against the tax cuts that we talked about specifically. Right. Um, and I think he was tax. supportive of property tax relief last session, like some of the stuff. I assume De depending I think on everybody what that, voted for the yeah. yeah. On what that I mean, sometimes that's not a tax cut. Like if it's just the state using my state tax dollars to buy down my property taxes, you didn't really give me any tax relief. Sure. Um anyway, I we could we could have a whole show just on that. But um I am glad. I think he's a real authentic person. I think he's genuine. I think he's gonna run an honest campaign. And I look forward to uh, I look forward to, to watching it. I, you know, I think yeah. I, I really I mean, even though Merrill Pepcorn is not because I mean, I've watched him in the legislature. He I mean, he alluded to a joke in a couple times where I probably zinged him a few times on some things. Um, 
but I, I you know, I, I, what I'm really interested in is Republicans feeling some heat in North Dakota. I think that would make Republican leadership in North Dakota, if at the very least they had some fear of losing some elections. Um, so, Rob, I think some kudos to the Dems leadership. I mean, to have Trigby Hammer, Chris, Katrina Christensen, and Merrill Pepcorn, those are all, I mean, not perfect candidates, but pretty strong candidates in really, really uphill races. Um, and, and, and so, you know, kudos to them. I think now, Katrina, the I think Katrina's much like? improved. Um, I think Trigby's got a great resume. Um, I think Merrill uh, is, has some skills in connecting with people that probably come from his. So I think you're right. I mean, we're, we need to admit that we're grading on a scale here, but. Oh, for sure. It's a, a, on the scale of it being a really, 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 really hard environment. Yes. To recruit and compete yes, in. Absolutely. And it, that's not me being, I mean, that's just reality. I'm not trying to reality, be a jerk yeah. to these people. I'm just, it is what it is. Um, well, let's, let's talk a little bit. Um, let's switch gears and talk about something nationally. Doug Burgum spending Easter in Mar at Mar-a-Lago in, uh, in Florida with the Trump family. And and the interesting thing about that is it wasn't ballyhooed anywhere, right? Like it wasn't normally politicians, you follow their social media and they're taking pictures everywhere they go. Right. And you're getting in granular detail. Like I went here and I met with these people. I went to this diner and I ate an omelet with these people. Like I, I mean, they're doing all this stuff. And then all of a sudden he goes to Mar-a-Lago and nothing's on social media. I catch wind of it because some Trump super fan who's at Mar-a-Lago is filming like from afar behind the velvet rope, um, you know, filming the Trump family and who just happens to be in the background, but Doug Burgum and, and, and North Dakota's first lady. So, I mean, I thought it was really interesting why he was down there. And then Chad, you haven't had a chance to read this article. It, it published just as we started recording, but it turns out, I mean, if, if you've been watching some of the fundraising stuff, we're, we're, you know, Joe Biden and the Democrats have been putting up big fundraising numbers nationally. There's been a lot of headlines sort of, you know, contrasting that where, um, you know, basically contrasting that where, you know, Trump is lagging. And so the Trump campaign has been hyping this upcoming fundraiser in at Mar-a-Lago in Florida where they're hoping to raise like $33 million or something like that, which kind of tells me if they're putting a specific figure on it, it kind of feels like, they're setting a bar because they already have some commitments or anything. But anyway, somebody after my my post about Bergam being there, somebody sent me an in a copy of the invite to that or one of the flyers or something advertising that fundraiser. And guess who's mentioned as a special guest? Uh, basically a hundred, uh, uh, you know, a headliner for that fundraiser. Um, which by the way, uh, you can get plates for at eight hundred and fourteen thousand dollars per person. Um. So do you want to it's split Doug a seat, Rob? It's Doug you, you split one? Yeah, sure. Um, yeah. If we split it a couple couple hundred ways, maybe we could I, we could share the the plate. I I I could sell my house and still not afford half of half of that um, <laughs> of that plate. So no, I don't. Um, but anyway, I. But I mean, Rob, you have to look. It does cover. Trump's legal bills. So, it does. I mean, yeah. it goes to a good cause. Yeah, just like his Bible sales revenues go to helping him defray the cost of the defamation suit against him from the woman that he was found civilly liable of raping. So, great stuff all the way around. Um, but Doug Burgum's down there, and I just, I don't know what else he's doing other than he's angling for that proud tradition of being one of the donors who get a cushy administration appointment in, in the next. And by the way, but proud bipartisan um, tradition. Sure. Everybody does it. Um, but I mean, I think that's what he's angling for, right? I mean, why else is he in Mar-a-Lago doing this? Rob, all I can say is yuck, yuck, yuck. Uh, you know, there, there's a saying that the kids use about somebody being too thirsty for attention. I feel like that's what Burgum's coming across as. It feels like, yeah. I mean, I'm sure he was invited to Mar-a-Lago, but it feels like he's just, you know, following Trump around and doing whatever Trump wants. And I don't know, spending Easter with the Trump family rather than your own family doesn't make a lot of sense to well, me. Well, you you uh, pointed out before we were that that when 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 Burgum ended his presidential campaign, he held a press conference. And sort of tearfully, as, as he's as he's wont to do, very he emotionally, emotional. he emotionally talks about wanting to spend more time with his family, and then spends Easter with the Trump family. 
Yeah, and who knows? He might have been with his family before that or maybe, whatever. Maybe but his family's with. Me, I, I don't it, know. I don't know. Yeah, it, do, it does seem to me, though, if you're a North Dakotan, it does seem like our governor is far more focused on uh, his future gig than his current gig and has been for some. I mean, Pepcorn jokingly said our former, I mean, current governor, Doug Burgum. Um, yeah. I, I just hope we're not missing things back here because um, – He's more focused on getting Donald Trump's attention than. I mean, than we're, what's we're probably in the not. I, I mean, we're. I, I don't. I don't like it. You know, I don't know what. It, but I mean, let's let's put it because I, I I think there's probably people listening to this who are saying, well, Port and Oban just don't like Donald Trump, so of course they're going to be grossed out that Doug Burgum is down there, you know, um, ingratiating himself to Trump. But here's the thing. What about what Doug Burgum himself has said about Donald Trump? I mean, remember when he was running for president and somebody asked him, is Donald Trump somebody you do business for with? And he said no during a national television interview. He said no. And then, you know, the question was why? And he says, you know, I think after after kind of a pause, he says, you know, I think you're judged by the people you associate yourself with or the people you do business with. And now he's down there doing this and it's such a 180. Also, I went back and I looked at the FEC records, Chad, for Doug Burgum's political contributions, going all the way back to the early 2000s on, on the FEC website. And it's about what you would expect. A lot of donations to Republican congressional candidates, mostly here in North Dakota, people like Rick Berg, Kevin Kramer, John Hoven, um, Kelly Armstrong, um, down through the years. Also some donations to uh, Republican president, you know, congressional right. races in other states, Montana, you know, um, and then also, you know, he he donated to the George W. Bush camp. Bush Cheney donated pretty to, straightforward stuff. Donated to Mitt Romney. Donated, but in, in 2016 cycle, so that's when Trump's ascended. Doesn't make any donations to Trump in the 2016 cycle. Uh, does donate to Marco Rubio, uh, who was running for president that cycle, but not Donald Trump. You go to the 2020 campaign, no presidential donations at all. From Doug individually. I went and looked at his presidential campaign. His presidential campaign doesn't have much money left in it. It's got, you know, less than $100,000 and then like 14, almost $14 million in debt, most of which is owed to the candidate himself because he loaned almost $15 million to his campaign. Um, I have a feeling he's probably going to forgive most of those loans. But I mean, there's there's really no money in this presidential campaign. There's no evidence that he, that he, he transferred money from his presidential campaign. Um, so I, I mean, if he's if he has supported Donald Trump financially in in all the years you know since 2015 when Donald Trump came down the escalator and launched himself into this era, launched us into this era of politics, I can't find evidence of it. Which again is just, I think that's part of. I mean, even if you like Donald Trump, this about face that Doug Burgum has gone for somebody who again I can't find a reported dollar that Doug Burgum has given to Donald Trump. Um, right. to be elected. And, it, and it's not because Donald Trump has changed for the better during that. It's not like in the 2024 cycle, all of a sudden he's, he's moderated he's, himself. I mean, he's become worse. He's less right? moderate. I mean, I mean, and again, yeah. maybe, maybe you like that. Maybe you're a big Trump fan and you find that appealing, whatever. Trump is but more that, Trump. He has become Trumpier. I think we can all agree on that. Doug Burgum has been historically. No. And so I think you're right. I mean, to your, your first point there, you know, Chad Oban, Rob Port don't like Donald Trump. But he said, Doug Burgum said, you know, basically you're judged by the people you hang out with. Well, we're now judging Doug Burgum based on the people he's hanging out with. Yeah. And he's spending the Easter holiday with Donald Trump at mar lago And then... I think the other thing that it's just not relatable to people to be able to cut a check for nearly a million dollars to go to a fundraiser. I mean, there that's is, just not. There is a cheaper option. I mean, let's let's not for only 200. You it, it, That's if you want to be at the chairman level, eight hundred and fourteen thousand six hundred dollars okay. per person. There is a cheaper option if you just want to be at the host committee level. That's two hundred and fifty thousand dollars a person, so only a quarter million dollars. Where's the like the hundred two hundred and fifty dollar level? Is that one on there? Somewhere? I don't. I don't see it. Wasn't on what was sent me, so okay. I don't know if there's lower levels. But generally, those, Rob, you don't have a hundred dollar level along with an eight hundred thousand dollar level. That's not not, the, not when you're looking at. By the way, Harold Ham is uh, on this list of co-chairs, um, but I mean, it's a uh, you know, it's it's uh, Robert Wood. Um, you know, I mean, it, these are some. 
<laughs> Robert Mercer, Rebecca Mercer. I mean, these are some these are some uh, some high rich people. Very, very, very rich people. Um, I like to call them high net worth individuals. Right? High That's net worth I'm individuals, and then uh, the special guests are basically our our Senator Tim Scott, Governor Doug Burgum, and Vivek Ramaswamy. Um, Sounds like a tryout for vice president to me. It sure does, right? Tim Scott, Doug Burgum, or, or Ramaswamy. I mean, that's that's if not the entire short list for VP, that's a good chunk of it, right there. Yeah, I saw a list of like eight names over the weekend. I think Politico had out, and Burgum was one of those eight names. Yeah. So is Christy Nome, um, and then then a handful of senators. Christy but Nome. I don't know. Christy I, Nome's all- too busy cutting ads for dentists. So weird. So weird. <laughs> I don't know if anybody, I don't know why I'm diverging into that other than it's, it's flipping weird. Listen, corporate sponsorship of governors is weird. Right. Although I, I recently had our mutual friend, Dean Mitchell told me he was at the Oklahoma state Capitol and the Oklahoma state Capitol has corporate sponsors. Like there's banners of, you know, corporate sponsor, and I'm sure it's for the building or whatever, but how strange is that? Well, I mean, Burgum, you imagine- when, when, Berg, I remember when Burgum started doing, because normally like like when, when the governors in North Dakota do state of the state addresses, they do them um, to sessions of the legislature. So it's, it's every, Burgum started doing them um, every year, which fine. I mean, if the intent is to share information, but I, I mean, the first, I zinged them because they had corporate sponsors. Yeah. But could you imagine going into the Great Hall at the Capitol and having like, you know, sponsored the, the by North Dakota legislature this, brought to you by, you know, Conagra North Dakota United. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I wish. No, no, I don't want to do that. <laughs> okay. Uh, 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 this division anyway. of the North Dakota National Guard brought to you by the Chamber of Commerce. I, Altria. <laughs> that sounds, that sounds terrible. I don't yeah. want that. I think that's gross. Um, Hey, yeah. Rob, speaking of corporate sponsorships, what are you doing this weekend? Where are you going? I am going to the North Dakota Republican Party Convention in Fargo. Uh, uh, you have wrote I, some really interesting things about uh, what's going to happen at the outset of this thing. It is going to be chaotic from the get go. I mean, the, the most I mean, setting aside like all the finagling. I mean, we've got 15, I think 15 or so resolutions that we've talked about on a previous show and I've written about some of which are very controversial. Each one of those are going to be debated individually. They're all going to have to have hand counts of votes. I mean, everything else, but like, so, so if you've ever been to a political convention, you understand it. It's basically like a governing body for the Republican party and they have party business that they're going to do. Cause all these delegates have been selected from districts from all over the state. And they're coming together almost sort of like a legislature in a way. Mm -hmm. And they're there to vote on these issues. But one of the things is like credentialing the delegates, right? Is, is making sure, okay, everybody who's on the floor and who's going to be voting is here properly. And you understand it's a political process, you know? So, I mean, I'm sure there's been, there's a reason for that rule where maybe one candidate or somebody slipping a bunch of delegates in the door. So that's one of the first things they do is they credential the delegates. Well, there's been a huge food, food fight over the delegates from District 37. Now, District 37 held their um, delegate election back in early January. Um, and Rob, Dick, 37 is in Dickinson. 37 is in Dickinson. Dickinson. It's the home. It's the home district of House Majority Leader Mike LaFour, um, which is which is notable. If if you haven't been reading my stuff, I'm going to tell you why that's notable here in a minute. Um, so District that back in January. So we come up on the convention. We're now in late March, and the credentialing committee. You know, the, the party has a credentialing committee that makes sure it gets all the reports from all the districts like, OK, these are our delegates for the convention and they go through it. And there's an opportunity to lodge any objections to those those credentials before the convention. And the reason why they do it before the convention is they don't want the opening hours of the convention to be a 12 hour food fight over each individual person's. You know, so basically, if, if, if you're going to challenge delegates, you have to bring it before the credentialing committee Well, there's a group of. MAGA aligned, pop, populist aligned district chairs, and up to and including some party officials like um, Republican National Committee woman Lori Hins, who challenged District 37's delegates, said they didn't elect them properly, they, they, that they didn't follow the NDGOP's rules in electing the delegates. Now, of course, District 37 disputes this, uh, but the, the, the timing is like the Hins and others who brought the complaint says they knew about this in January. They don't bring the 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 they don't bring the complaint until late March. 
when it's too late for the district to hold a, even, even if there were problems, it's too late for the district to hold a do-over. So now, you know, basically what, what the credentialing committee do is they punted and they put this issue before, you know, they're, they're saying, okay, district 37 delegates are included, but somebody can raise this complaint during the convention and so what's going to happen is like one of the first thing the party does, right? Like we're, we're gonna, we have music and then somebody says, welcome. And then we do like the national anthem and all that kind of stuff. And we have a prayer and then they have to credential. And before we even get to that, there is going to be a food fight, assuming somebody objects. There's going to be a food fight over whether District 37 gets seated. And, and it's yeah. so, I mean, there's, there's so many parts to this because like part of the motivation is, like, like, really, the only competitive race at this convention for, for endorsement is the Republican National Committee race. Shane Gettle, who's been a longtime member of the Republican National Committee, to the point where he's almost on the executive committee of the National Party. He is being challenged by a gentleman by the name of Steve Nagel, who's an anti-vax chiropractor, um, who's very much in the mega wing. He's being So part of the motivation, I think, is District 37 has normie delegates. And blocking District 37 probably helps Nagel because the gubernatorial race, Tammy Miller's not participating at the convention. So Kelly's going to win the endorsement by default in the House race. Um, you know, it's it's Julie Fedorchek and and Alex Blas. And I, I, I think or I don't know how to pronounce his last name, but, um, you know, I mean, that Rick Becker can't participate by the rules. So, you know, you think that for, so those really aren't. As things stand now, those really aren't competitive races. Right. That Republican National Committee race is the only really competitive race. So there's that. And then there's also the fact that Mike LaFour made the mega crowd in the party mad when he called on Nico Rios to resign after Nico Rios berated law enforcement officers with homophobic and racist comments when he was being arrested for DUI. LaFour asked for Rios to resign. LaFour uh, stripped Rios of a committee assignment to the House Judiciary Committee. And then that made... He's so mad that 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 Sandy Sanford, the party chair, who initially joined LaFour in calling on Rios to resign, went on a talk radio show and backtracked on that. So it's just it's just it's a power move, right? So Rob, a couple observations. And the first one is we live in a state where Shane Gettle is not conservative enough. Yeah. for the Republican Party. We I mean, Shane Gettle over is over a conservative, right? Yes. I mean, there's no doubt about it. That is crazy. Secondly, I couldn't help but think about you talking about uh, uh, Representative Rios, you know, the column you had up this weekend of his back and forth with Senator Scott Meyer. Clearly, Representative Rios has not learned his lesson. Yeah, uh, continued from, to, to just casually use homophobic slurs, yeah. transphobic slurs. I mean, just, I mean, he asked Senator Meyer if he's, Senator Meyer, I mean, Senator Meyer didn't exactly cover himself in glory in this exchange either, but Senator Meyer, you know, tweets at him like, are you drunk? And then Rios comes back and says, are you gay? Uh, I well, mean, it, 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 it was clear to me based on the timing that there probably was alcohol flowing through both. Of I, don't their I, yeah. I don't know that. I don't know that to and, be true. But here, here's what I'll say. Both of them, and we're getting off topic slightly, should be absolutely embarrassed as elected officials yes. for what they engaged in in the wee hours of the morning and that the, both of their caucuses should look at what they're doing there and, and and have some conversations because that makes North Dakota look bad when there's these stuff flying back on Twitter. And both of them, get off of Twitter, for God's sakes, your elected Especially officials. Get off of Twitter at 2 o'clock in the morning, too, by the way, yeah. Yeah. or, or 1, so, 1 o'clock, whatever it was. But going back to the convention, so let's play this out. So they, they have a vote, and it sounds like you're not sure if they have the votes to maintain the delegates from 37 or not. Let's say they throw all of them out. Do then all the normies walk out of the convention? If so, you're Kirsten Baszler and you're up for the letter of support for DPI and it's your son who's the chair of District 37, do you stay at yeah, that Mitch convention Baszler. and ask Mitch for Baszler. those people's yeah. Mitch Baszler? Do right. you sit there and ask for their letter of support for the superintendent of public instruction? So here's another I'm scenario. In in 2022, we saw either the Bastiat, the Mega Wing, whatever you want to call them. We saw them try to unseat Perry Schaefer as the chair of the convention. Now, the chair of the convention is basically the person up front. They, with with input from a parliamentarian, you know, they make rulings about, you know, rule changes or, or whatever. I mean, they're, they're presiding over the process. So... 
And then they put up Gary Emineth, who lost another election. Who lost, yeah. So, uh, (laughs) all right. We're not, stop sidetracking me. Um, Okay, so I I think what's going to happen is, I suspect Sandy Sanford is going to rule the complaint about District 37 out of order. And I think she's right to for a number of reasons. I don't think it was timely. I don't think the motivations are appropriate. And and also the fact that their complaint, there's some other down in the weeds stuff. And is she able to just shut it down? She can rule chairman? it. She can rule it out of order. But I think if she does that, where she says then, this, this, this was not brought properly. So if she does that, I think what happens then is the next thing they do is they elect the chair of the convention. They may have the votes to replace her. And then if they replace her, then maybe they revisit the district 37 issue. And the, she's not replaced as chairman. She's replaced of chairman chair of, the, of convention. the convention, which is a temporary role, but basically presiding over the convention that can make rules and everything else. So now, now you put somebody in there who's going to facilitate what the mega crowd wants to do. Then maybe they, they do lock district 37 out. Then maybe they also vote to let Rick Becker set aside the rule. Because Rick Becker, for those of you maybe who haven't been following along, uh, Rick Becker can't participate in this year's, convention and he can still seek the nomination on the June primary ballot, but he, he left the party and ran as an independent against the convention endorsed candidate last cycle. The party has a rule that says, if you do that, you can't, you can't seek the the convention's endorsement for six years. So, but they could waive that rule. But now if they do that, if you're Julie Fedorchuk, do you stick around? I mean, at what point, at what point do people say, this is, this is not, this is not a, process that has integrity and then you have a couple of thousand north dakotans who've spent their hard-earned money taking time off from that's work a thousand, I mean, if, if, if you're from minot or bismarck or willison or that's a thousand fifteen hundred dollar trip to fargo yeah yeah and, and so do those i mean yeah how do you get in your car in williston or tioga at the end of this week well not, not, not even the end of this week it starts friday morning sure so you're gonna have to take a day off work to get right. down there too. Uh, and, and also like if you're district 37, you're going to go through all that, take a day off work and spend the money and everything to show up and be told in the first hour or so, you're not welcome. Go home. And, and I assume the way district 37 elect their de- elected their delegates isn't that different than that, how they've historically elected their no, delegates. Uh, what, what Mitch, and I wasn't in the room, but what, what Mitch Basler says, he's the district chair and, and also the son of, of the superintendent of public schools, Kirsten Basler. Um, what he said is that, uh, they had a, they had a delegate committee and the delegate committee came up with a slate of delegates, you know, so this is who we want. And so, you know, the, the committee reported, these are the delegates we want that was brought to the convention. They put the slate forward. They called for any nominations, any, any additional people want to be delegates. They said that there were none. And so then they basically voted. They just did a voice vote and, and voted in the slate of delegates by acclamation. At the time, there was no objection to this. You know, the objection didn't come until right before the deadline when it was too late for them to, to even fix anything, even if there was a problem. And I'm not convinced there was a problem. And by the way, if you really want to drill down on this, I posted the entire video from a, two, a more than two and a half hour credentialing committee meeting where it becomes readily apparent that this was like, like the people from District 37 that they added to their complaint, I suppose to give it a local, a local uh, touch, they didn't really know what they were signing up for. Like, it's very apparent. They didn't know that the goal was to lock out District 37's delegates or anything like that. Um, it, it's readily apparent. Travis Zablotny, who's a district chair, you know, sort of mega populist district chair from up here in Minot, you know, was, was, was instrumental in instigating this. And I'm hearing rumblings now from district chairs who were saying, you know, now that I think about it, I think that that wing of the party kind of had observers at a lot of these meetings. I mean, I think they were looking they were looking for opportunities to try to use the rules to lock people out. So is this Jared Hendricks? I mean, is he the one that's organizing I all of this stuff? I, I mean, I, I don't know. I mean, okay. it's, it's that wing of the party. Sure. But sure, like Lori, Hunt, Travis, the Blotney. I mean, it's, I mean, th- those are the people that are involved. And I, I realize there's a lot of people probably listening to this and their eyes are rolling back into who are these people that you're talking right. about. I, I understand how down in the weeds this is. and But the reason why this is important is this is North Dakota's dominant political organization. The people who get the Republican endorsement, the people who get the Republican nomination win at the ballot box. 
I mean, that's that's reality in North Dakota. So this is the process through which that party's candidates are being selected, and the process is broken. And the idea, again, I'll go back to Shane Gettle, that Shane Gettle is not conservative enough for a segment of the GOP. But this is the lengths you have to go to elect your guy to the RNC committee men. I mean, so obviously they must not feel like Dr. Nagel, uh, who, by the way, you said is anti-vax. He's a, a universal conspiracy theorist. Um, who, they, like they have to do this. They have to. They have Chad, to Chad, Chad's point is his his uh, his his notions about um, things being rigged or fixed or or whatever doesn't begin and end with the pharmaceutical industry. Right. And now let's talk about the fact that they're trying to rig a process to right. dis disenfranchise a whole district of delegates in order to win. Right. Like this group of people who thinks that all these elections are rigged or not fair, people are cheating, are now trying to rig things for them to win. There are, or, or at least, you know, work the rules in ways that are certainly not in the spirit of the process. I mean, and it's, it's not just this, it's, District 2, where Bob Harms, former party chair, former party treasurer, former uh, legal counsel to the Schaefer administration and the Hoven, Hoven administration, he wants to run for state senate. He wants a copy of District 2's bylaws so he can seek the local party endorsement. He can't get a copy of the bylaws. District 38, Lisa Olson, former member of the District 38 Republican Executive Committee, longtime Minot City Councilwoman, wants to run for the North Dakota House of Representatives to replace Larry Ballou, who stepped down. She sends in her membership dues to the party in preparation of seeking the convention endorsement and the executive committee votes to not even not even allow her to be a member of the party. You go to District 30 in Bismarck where the incumbents are being asked to run against a, a district chair who is also running against them. You look at District 14, where you know the the the, the district chair, where that's uh, John Nelson, uh, Robin Wise, uh, Jerry Klein, three longtime Republican incumbents, um, who all of a sudden now have a a district chair that is absolutely hostile to them, that lets in the door Brandon Pritchard from this outside group to to just to give all the delegates false information about their voting record. I mean, not to mention scheduling the meeting at a corner of the district that's literally 100 miles away from a lot of Right. District 14 is the size of Connecticut. So Yeah. Yeah, I mean, yeah. it's it's just one thing after another where they're they're not their intent is not to run a fair and open process. Their intent is to run a process that is conducive to the outcomes that they want. And that is While wrong. Well, absolutely convinced the 2020 election was rigged while absolutely convinced the North Dakota elections aren't run fairly. And maybe that's why they don't think things are done fairly because it's they're projecting. They're They're projecting. (laughs) They know, they know what they do when they're in power. I mean, that's, I don't know how else to look at it. And I I mean, listen, whatever happens with this election cycle, and I don't know how much the stuff at the convention is going to matter. I mean, ultimately the House endorsed the House nomination, the gubernatorial nomination, those are going to be settled in June. But but Rob, if this if this convention turns into a chaotic situation, and generally I think they figure stuff out so it doesn't end up in worst case scenario. But so what is the endorsement worth to Kelly Armstrong? What is the endorse, endorsement worth to Julie Fedorchak right. if the whole thing is like just gross and you different? I mean, you're talking about disenfranchising. One, we only have 47 legislative districts, and right. you're talking about kicking out a whole one. The whole community of Dickinson's delegates would not be. Like, There's some other Dickinson well, area districts, but sure. a big a big chunk of them, yeah. Yeah, sure. that's Kelly Armstrong. Well, Kelly Armstrong's district 36. Yeah. Right. So he's on the but it's his home community. They're just going to disenfranchise these people from participating. And and if you want a fair thing, like your point, Lori Hintz would have brought this forward earlier. So it could have been fixed. But the goal of waiting till the last minute is to make it so they can't fix it. I don't know. But here's what I will tell you. You mentioned um, uh, the, the House candidate up in Minot. The, the wonderful thing about the other not dominant party in North Dakota, they'll take anybody. Just show up. Just <laughs> yeah. show up. They'll take you. Well, that they was, don't even I charge mean, you money to be part of their group. That's that's what I was. I mean, that was the point I was making about Merrill Pepcorn. Is I do think Democrats have an opportunity, and I think that if 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 Democratic candidates this cycle, and I'm not convinced that they will, 
But if they can narrow their their focus to issues that are attractive to people who have been voting for Republicans, who are feeling feeling disillusioned with the Republican Party, not just in the Trump era, but maybe, well, I don't know what we would call it, the Lori Hins era, you know, what's happening to the North Dakota Republican Party where it's become chaotic and they're looking for a landing place, you know, I'm really interested in what Democrats are going to offer. Now, I'm not convinced. I'm not. I, I will. I will believe it when I see it. I'm not convinced that they can, but they should. They really should. Right. Yeah. And and what does that look like? Like we're talking about this inside the weeds uh, thing that's happening at the party, the Lori Hintz era. But it's but, but, but it's but not we're just about the general election where the vast majority of Republicans sure. who are going to vote in the general election. Have no idea what we're talking but about. It's, right but it's but it's not just that. I, I'll tell you what they do know. What we're talking about are the Stenjum email situation. What they do know what we're talking about is uh, Jason Doctor getting a sweetheart lease deal. You know all the other things. Um, or or or, or, or the, power sort of thing. Yeah. The, the, the relentless focus on on social issues that are I would argue are are probably outside of of what most North Dakotans want. It's not just yes. This is this it, it manifests itself in the, you know, hyper inside, down in the weed stuff that we're talking about, but it also manifests itself in very, in ways that are very, very visible to the general electorate. So let's, let's talk this through a little bit. If, how do you avoid sort of, if you're Trig V. Hammer and Katrina Christensen, I think it's even more difficult to sort of localize a race, right? Because it's a federal race, you know, it, you they know, can't, the they can't talk about, about, they can't, I mean, the, the, what are they going to get talking about? Send them emails or whatever. Yeah. But, but I mean, so how, what does this look like to you? I mean, does it, is it them just focusing on, you know, basically saying the national stuff doesn't matter. I'm going to hyper focus on making this a local race, but then you have to convince the voters that the national stuff doesn't matter. And there's a reason yeah. why Kelly and Tammy are talking about Donald Trump. Yeah. I mean, there's, yeah. And so. I you mean, know, is, there, if, is there an audience to talk about, listen, trying to indict or uh, uh, impeach um, Joe Biden was a waste of time and, and that even, even Republicans at this point should admit this cause it's gone nowhere. Um, so is there an audience you, for that in North Dakota? I don't know that there is. I, I don't know. Do you think there's an audience of like non Fox viewer Republicans that, that would be open to a Democrat? I mean, I just like, it just I don't know if we're there so yet. I, I mean, I mean, the, the, the thing that I keep thinking of is that I, I mean, the, there's a basic truth about political movements and you win through addition, not subtraction. And right now, the North Dakota Republican Party is in subtraction mode. Well, I mean, right. they, they are literally trying to exclude people. And the Dems need to figure out how to be in addition. How do mode. you how do you give those people a place to land? Right. And I don't. I, I, I don't. I'm not prepared to offer an answer. I'm also not prepared. I mean, I'm going to tell the I'm going to tell them to be conservative, traditional Republicans because that's what appeals to me. And, and I understand right. they can't do that. They're not Republicans. Right. They're Democrats. Right. And that's it. You know, we one one hand we say we want authentic, but on the other hand, we're saying, but don't necessarily be true to yourself. And we're seeing it on the Republican but I, but I side. Think, I think there is a way to triage, though. I think there's a way to prioritize. Yeah. Well, and I think there are people who like prioritize the issues you're talking about. We've talked a lot about on the show. It's about style, right? Here are the things that I'm going to focus my time on. I don't care about this other stuff. I'm not going to focus on social issues. I'm going to talk about the issues that matter to you. Um, now, the, the question is, and I'm with you, I don't know that there is an audience for that in today's... There may not I mean, be. I, I'm wondering, I mean, maybe this cycle isn't the cycle, but I just, I wonder how much longer, you know, Republicans in North Dakota and the MAGA movement can hold things together when it's this, when it's constantly yeah. stabbing everybody in the back. I, I don't so know how you do, how you do that. It is interesting, though, there also is sort of in the normie Republican world, like with these primaries going around uh, the state is how are Democrats going to help the normie Republicans? And part of me, I understand that it's good for the government. It's good for the state of North Dakota to make sure the normies win the primary. But you're cannibalizing but your own party. Well, but it's not the yeah, it's not the Democrats job to right. fix this. Yeah. Um, I mean, I, I made that argument back when Doug Burgum was running in 2016 and there were a lot, there was a lot of Democrats who were saying, get out there and vote for Doug over, boy, a lot of Democrats are maybe regretting that now, um, given what Burgum has. I mean, I think he was a very moderate governor. I, again, getting back to why it's so gross what he's doing in Mar-a-Lago right now. But uh, I mean, I really think that hurt them, right? I mean, when, when Doug is on the June primary 
And all of a sudden, you're, I mean, you go from, in a typical primary election, about two Republican ballots cast for every one Democratic ballot cast. And all of a sudden, in 2016, it's like five or six to one. I forget the number. That's, that's speaking to a lot of Democrats who crossed over. How many of them came back? Yeah, well, and I will tell you, after that primary, I was with a group, I think it was eight Democrats. And um, one of us voted for Wayne Stenjum. Six voted for Doug Burgum. And one person took the dem ballot because your primary didn't all the, matter yeah I, yeah. All, I think all those people now consider themselves democrats still yeah uh, but you're right some might not have come back i mean they might have been over i mean you're right now doug burgum today is different than 2016 doug right burgum, well I, I, doug burgum today is different than than 2023 doug burgum in a lot of ways <laughs> i i mean it just is i mean the 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 the, the, the about face has been abrupt i mean he again he went from i wouldn't do business with donald trump to hey donald let's have easter together um ugh, I, I don't know how you do that but that so do you he think, did it. so in all serious like do you think people care do you think north dakotans <laughs> are paying attention to what doug Burgum is doing and do they care i i can see the number of people who are reading my articles when i write about it and yeah i mean i think so okay um yeah and i talk to people who care who are like especially a lot of Especially that. I mean, do, do they care about some of this down in the weeds that you and I are talking about? Although I will say my District 37 are also very, very well read. So, yeah, I, I mean, it's okay. hard. I mean, I don't know how much this penetrates. And, and again, my audience is a very engaged audience, but they're also Drop, an influential top. audience. So I, I don't know. I don't know. Yeah. I hope yeah, so. I think it's just interesting. I, I have heard from people who are Burgum supporters who are like, Ugh. So I well I hear I mean just just to 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 end on a depressing note, um over the Easter holiday I was overhearing a phone conversation from somebody who's talking on their on their cell phone to somebody, and they were talking about how Doug Burgum dropped out of the presidential race because his son shot a cop. Talking with with just absolute confidence, and so I'm thinking about this for a minute. I'm thinking they must Let's be, be conflating. There's no truth by, by to the that. Way, right? Not true. <laughs> Not even close to not, true. Not, this is a fantasy world. I think what happened is that they conflated what happened with Senator Kramer's son, that tragic where he had a mental health or a, and, and, and you know, was on a chase and, and, and through a car accident, didn't shoot an officer, but through a car accident caused the death of a law enforcement officer. I think that this person thought that that was Doug Burgum. And that it was Doug Burgum's son. Now, it was not. Oh. But, I mean, the thing is, I'm listening to this, and I'm just wanting to pull my hair out. Like, how? What planet? And, and granted, this is an anecdote. It's one person on a phone. But there is. I mean, I, I, that is the confounding thing about this, is, is there is a large swath of the electorate that has no, even some of the, like, that was one of the biggest stories of the last 12 months. What happened to Senator Kramer's son? They don't even get that right. Yeah, and we it's safe to assume that person's not listening to this podcast. No, probably not. Or if they are, they're yeah. not listening very closely. Yeah, and the depra- their vote counts the same as ours. <laughs> Welcome to democracy, my friend. Amen. I'm it's for the it. Worst, it's what, what's the saying? It's the worst system of government except for all the others. Anyway, we are way we are massively over, but maybe that's good. You got some bonus content because we're not. I don't know if we're going to have a podcast this weekend. I'm I'm hesitant to schedule anything because the Democratic convention is going on at the same time. The Republican convention, I think, is going to be chaos. I just don't know. So if you don't hear from us, maybe we'll try to do something Monday. Otherwise, we'll be back to Wednesday. I, I don't know. Uh, Chad's shaking his head. Um, so I don't know I'm when watching, we're going to. I'm going to watch baseball again Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday. Oh, man, the Dodgers are in Minneapolis. I am so jealous. Um, okay. By the way, a nice performance for the Yankees last night after you jinxed them. I did totally. I, Cause I was, I was spiking the football. Can you blame me for feeling good? We went into Houston and hung four L's on the Astros. Listen, it's not often that I'm like, yes, go Yankees. But when you beat the Astros and the Diamondbacks, this Dodgers fan is all for it. That's right. We did beat the Diamondbacks, but we didn't last night. Did not go swimmingly, but we could still win the series. All right, yeah. we're gonna end it there. We got our boring baseball talk in. We gave you almost twenty minutes of bonus content on this episode. Uh, there's probably not gonna be a podcast this weekend. I'm guessing, but we'll see. Um, but anyway, thanks for listening. We will be back again at some point. We'll talk <laughs> again.
Did you know Forum Communications Company has a robust podcast library? At inforum.com forward slash podcasts, we have everything from politics, sports, true crime, outdoor adventure, and more. Visit inforum.com forward slash podcasts and explore them all today.